Welcome to the Bogleheads Chapter Series. This episode was hosted by the Pre- and Early Retirement Life Stage Chapters and recorded October 29, 2022. The topic is Medicare, presented by Lonnie Thibodeau. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's philosophy for attaining financial independence. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as personalized investment advice. Welcome to the pre-retirement life stage uh, uh, discussion today with uh, Lonnie Tribido. With uh, he's going to talk about Medicare, and we'll be turning it over to him shortly. But at the beginning here, I'd like to talk about a few things. Uh, we will be recording this; it'll appear on Zoom on the Boglehead channel. So if you could please keep your video turned off. Um, secondly, we're going to be having questions. You can ask questions in the chat. Sometimes people will answer them for you. And if they're uh, they if they look like they uh, need to be asked, the the moderators will ask Lonnie about them. Uh, we're going to use during the question and answer period the raise hand function. And if you look at your Zoom control, you should have a, um, a control to raise your hand. And if you want to try doing that right now, you can just check that out if you've never done it. And I see a whole bunch of people with raised hands, which is good. And then you can hit the lower hand on the control also to lower it. So that's very good. Okay. So this afternoon, our meeting will be hosted by Lonnie Tribido. He's a insurance agent that, that owns his own agency. He was born in Rain, Louisiana. Most of his career was spent in the aviation industry and now he's in the healthcare business. And uh, he, we've talked to him a few times before and he loves his job and loves helping people. With that, I'll turn it over to Lonnie. Lonnie, if you want to share your screen, you can share your slides. And did, you want to, did you want to do the poll first? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, we're going to have a poll so Lonnie can get an idea of what we're dealing with here. So I'm going to turn the poll on. And in order to finish the poll and see the results, you have to answer all the questions. So if you could, um, just want to see you know, what people's situation is. So we'll give everyone a couple minutes there to to do the poll. I don't see it. Okay, should see there it now. There you go. I got it. Should see it now. Now, Lonnie, you're a co-host, so you should start seeing some numbers come in as people answer it. You won't actually be able to answer the poll, but uh, okay. you'll see the numbers come in. Yep, I see it. Thank you. Jim, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I think I think I'm gonna take a screenshot of the poll results. All right, very good. Okay, I think we're good on the poll. I'm gonna end the poll now. And I'll share the results so everyone can see where we stand. So it looks like we have a number of people that are um, going to be eligible soon and a few people that are already on Medicare. And then most of the people seem to be getting their insurance right now from their employer with a small portion of ACA, some others, and some of the people, of course, are on Medicare. And uh, about 10% of the people are going to be using COBRA to get to Medicare. So if that helps you, Lonnie, in, in your speech or your talk. It does. 
Thanks, okay. Jim. All right, I'm going to stop sharing the, the poll results and I'll turn it over to Lonnie. So. All right, I stopped sharing. All right, uh, here we go. Can everyone see that screen okay? No, we see you. Uh, Are you in a dual, a dual, a dual monitor? I thought so. There you go. Okay. You see your browser. Great. All right, Bogleheads. Well, first of all, as Jim said, I'm Lonnie Thibodeau, and I run an insurance agency. We specialize in Medicare plans, and uh, you guys have invited me uh, to come on board and talk about Medicare, how it works, when to enroll, et cetera. So what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes and go over some basic information and then leave the bulk of our time together this afternoon for Q&A, because as I visit with clients here in my office, I find that um, me talking and not listening doesn't work very well. But I will talk first, then I'll shut up and, and uh, be happy to answer any questions you guys have. So let me just uh, get started. So the first question is, uh, when do you enroll in, in Medicare? Well, if you're enrolling in Medicare due to your age, you become eligible for Medicare the first of the month that you turn 65. Unless your birthday is actually on the first of the month, then you're eligible for Medicare the first of the prior month. And you can begin the enrollment process with the Social Security Administration up to 90 days prior to your Medicare eligibility date. Now, if you're receiving Social Security retirement benefits prior to turning 65, Medicare will default to enrolling you in both Medicare Parts A and Part B. You should receive a Medicare card in the mail. It contains an 11-digit alphanumeric Medicare number, and it should include the effective dates for both Part A and Part B on that card. Now, if you're not receiving Social Security retirement benefits prior to turning 65, then Medicare will default to enrolling you in Medicare Part A only. And to enroll in Medicare Part B, you'll want to go to either ssa.gov or call the Social Security Administration at 800-772-1213. Now, for those who are enrolling due to end-stage renal disease, um, meaning if your kidneys no longer work and you need dialysis, you're eligible for Medicare, uh, and if you're eligible for Medicare due to at least 40 quarters of work, if you're already receiving Social Security or retirement, railroad retirement benefits, then you're the spouse, or if you're a spouse of a dependent child or a person who meets the requirements listed above, you can enroll in Medicare on the first day of the fourth month of your dialysis treatment. On the other hand, if you're receiving Medicare uh, Social Security disability, you're also eligible for Medicare after a 24 month qualifying period, meaning you can enroll in Medicare on the first day of the 25th of the 25th month of your SSDI. For those who don't have a Medicare card, this is what it looks like. Now, what happens if you don't enroll in Medicare in a timely fashion? Well, upon turning 65, you have a seven month window to enroll in Medicare Part B. It begins three months prior to the month of your 65th birthday and ends three months after the month of your 65th birthday. If you don't enroll, enroll in medical, Medicare when you're eligible and you don't have qualified health insurance, you're subject to a Part B late enrollment penalty of 10% per year for each full 12 months you're late. It's an annual penalty and will be levied on you for the rest of your life. Now, qualifying health insurance means employer-sponsored health insurance. So if you get your health insurance through your employer or your spouse's employer, uh, you, you don't have to enroll in Medicare Part B when, when you turn 65. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about this is we've had some clients who've come into our office and said, hey, I have COBRA, um, and, and so I'm going to postpone my enrollment in Medicare Part B. Well, currently, having COBRA, even though it comes through yours or your spouse's employer, does not exclude you from the late enrollment penalty. That, however, is under review, so it may change in the near future. So what if one spouse is eligible for Medicare and the other isn't? Common situation. Well, every situation is different, but here are some of the general guidelines. First, if the older spouse is the primary or only wage earner and is retiring and losing group health coverage, the younger spouse is eligible for COBRA for up to 36 months instead of the typical 18 months. Now, if COBRA won't last long enough uh, to get your, the non-working spouse to Medicare age, 
then the Affordable Care Act individual health plans are available. Many states also allow for temporary health insurance policy policies. And for those who qualify, we have some clients who are on Christian-based healthcare sharing ministries. So how much does Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B cost? Well, for most people, Medicare Part A is premium free. And if you, you or your spouse has worked at least 40 quarters of qualifying employment or self-employment throughout your career, then you will qualify for premium free Medicare Part A. If you haven't worked enough, quarter, enough quarters, then in 2023, your premiums will be either $278 per month or $506 per month. And again, that depends on how many qualifying quarters you have. Now in the Medicare documents, they used to spell out specifically how many quarters gave you each premium level. And unfortunately, in preparation for this presentation, I couldn't find that, that uh, table. Medicare Part B, while most people get Part A free, there is a standard premium for Medicare Part B. And in 2023, that standard premium is $164.90 per month, down approximately $5 per month from 2022. Now, for some people, you'll be subject to paying IRMA. IRMA stands for Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. And boy, is she mean. If you look at this table, in 2023, these will be your Medicare Part B premiums if your 2021 income is above $97,000 for an individual or $194,000 for a couple that files a joint tax return. And I'll just pause here for a second and let you look at these premiums and you can see where your income might fall on this table. Now, in addition to a, a higher premium for Medicare Part B, if you have uh, are subject to this higher income level, then you will also pay a higher premium for Medicare Part D or your prescription drug coverage. And it works like this. If you fall into the category of, as a married couple, 246,000 or above, then you pay whatever the Medicare Part D premium is, plus $12.20 per month. How much does Medicare Part D cost? Well, in the county where I office, Part D premiums range anywhere from $6.60 on the low end to $108 per month on the high end. And we select a Part D plan for our clients based on the total estimated out-of-pocket costs, and that's dictated by the prescriptions that they take on a regular basis. How much does Part C cost? Well, in our county, Part C premiums range anywhere from zero to $213 a month. We also have some plans that charge new zero premium and in addition, reduce your Medicare Part B premium by as much as $125 a month. Now this, this varies from county to county all across the country. How much does a Medicare supplement plan cost? Medicare supplement plans have a very wide range of, range of premiums depending on the selected plan, age, sex, and zip code. We see premiums in our area from about $45 per month for a high deductible plan to as much as $500 per month for people who are in their 80s and 90s for a very comprehensive plan. Now, one of the things I was asked to do was talk about health savings accounts because I understand many of you have health savings accounts. So here's how they work when you're on Medicare. Prior to enrolling in Medicare, you must stop making contributions to your health savings account because Medicare does not qualify as a high deductible health plan. Money that's in your HSA account can still be used to pay for all of the same qualified medical expenses as, they, as you did prior to enrolling in Medicare. In addition, you can pay for your Medicare Part B, Part C, or Part D premiums from your HSA account. However, currently you cannot use your HSA funds to pay for a Medicare supplement plan premium. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how Medicare works. Medicare Part A is your hospital coverage. Medicare Part B is your medical coverage. And in general terms, Medicare Part A has a per benefit deductible of $1,600. That covers you for up to 60 days in the hospital. If you're in the hospital beyond 60 days, day 60 through, 61 through 90 has a $400 daily copay. If you're there beyond 90 days, days 91 through 150 have an $800 copay. And after day 150, you pay all costs. Medicare Part B works differently, and then it has an annual deductible in 2023 of $226. Then Medicare covers 80% of your eligible expenses, leaving you, the beneficiary, to pay 20%. By the way, there's no cap on the beneficiary's 20% coinsurance. 
Parts A and B are the only two original parts of Medicare and are still the only parts delivered to you by the federal government or an agency thereof. CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Now, Medicare Part D, prescription drug plans, are offered by health insurance companies that have been approved by Medicare and meet CMS criteria for benefits, deductibles, et cetera. In 2023, the standard Medicare Part B deductible is $505. Many Part D plans waive the deductible for, for Tier 1 and Tier 2 drugs. Enrolling in a Part D plan can happen when you first become eligible for Medicare Part A, and then you can choose any Part D plan during the annual Medicare enrollment period, which runs from October 15th through December 7th each year. You can also enroll if you qualify for a special enrollment period, such as moving from one county to another. Typical Part D tier categories are Tier 1 preferred generics, Tier 2 generics, Tier 3 preferred brand, Tier 4 brand, Tier 5 specialty, and Tier 6 select diabetic drugs. In addition, most Part D plans have networks of pharmacies and, and preferred networks of pharmacies. And as you might imagine, your lowest co-pays are usually found at preferred pharmacies. Lonnie, sorry to interrupt, but could you maximize your screen and maybe kick up the text size a bit? Um, I had a couple comments in the chat about that. All right. Um, let me see what I can do. I think if you hit that little square next to the X at the top. Little go, square next to the X at the top. On the right side. Uh, it, within, it's uh, in the same line where it says presentation word. It's the blue title bar. Not seeing it, Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm seeing it on yours. It's, it's where it says file tools view. I'll cut this out of the video. Sorry about that, but I'm seeing a maximize. Okay, then we lost that screen now. Sorry, okay. <laughs> making it worse. Got it back. Yeah, you don't see a maximize button. It's like it's right next to the X in the blue bar. Don't see a blue bar. It's the title bar for the Word document. No, you're not seeing oh, it? Oh, no, it's hidden by the Zoom controls. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can move that over. Just drag that, click it and drag it over. And move it out of the way. Sorry about that. Ah. And then if you um, move the little slider in the bottom right corner, you can kick this text size up. Okay. There you go. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay. I'll let you back to it. Sorry about that. Great. No problem. Thank you for that. some things out of my way here. All right, there we are. Okay, Part C, also known as Medicare Advantage plans. Enrolling in Part C means that your Part A and Part B benefits of Medicare are actually being delivered to you by a health plan instead of by CMS. If you choose a plan that offers Part D, then obviously you're getting your prescription drug coverage from your Part C plan as well. Now, Part C plans have to cover all the same medical procedure codes as original Medicare. However, your out-of-pocket cost responsibility can differ from original Medicare with a Part C plan. Now, different types, there are different types of Part C plans. They come in HMO, PPO, PFFS, or private fee-for-service, special needs plans, and MSA plans. I'm going to focus on two types, HMOs and PPOs, because they probably constitute 90% plus of all uh, Medicare Part C plans out there. Now, both these plans have networks of medical providers you need to choose from, but the major difference is this. In most cases, enrolling in a Medicare HMO means no coverage outside the plan's network unless it's a medical emergency. In addition, in most cases, you must get a referral from your primary care physician prior to making an appointment with a specialist. PPO plans have a network as well, but you can typically get coverage for using non-network medical providers at a higher cost to use, and you don't have to get a referral to visit a specialist. All Part C plans are required to have an annual out-of-pocket maximum. The highest allowed by CMS in 2023 is $7,500 in network and $12,450 outside the network. But many plans offer a lower out-of-pocket maximum than allowed by Medicare. Many Part C plans offer benefits that Medicare doesn't. Things like vision, dental, hearing, over-the-counter benefits, and a fitness benefit. Oh, 
Uh, yeah, I put hearing in there. Never mind. Now, in order to enroll in Medicare Part C, you must be enrolled in Medicare's Part A and B. You can enroll when you first become eligible for Part B, and in each year during the Medicare annual enrollment period or with the special election period, you can choose a different Part C plan. The important consideration about enrolling in a Medicare Part C plan is there is no medical underwriting. Now, Medicare Supplement Plan Enrollment. With Medicare Supplements, you enjoy a six-month Medicare Supplement Open Enrollment Period beginning the date you enroll in Medicare Part B. During that time, you can choose any Medicare Supplement Plan offered in your area with no medical underwriting. You also get a guaranteed issue window when disenrolling from an employer plan. Now, after your open enrollment period, enrolling in a Medicare supplement plan usually requires underwriting. And this is an outline of what Medicare supplement plans look like. And I'm going to reduce this in size just a little bit. But that was a little too much. Bear with me. So as you can see, Medicare supplement plans carry letter designations A through N with some of the letters skipped in there. Um, and, and one would think that we would start on one side with the least comprehensive plan and go to the other side with the most comprehensive, but unfortunately that's not the way it works. The most comprehensive plan available uh, for some people is Medicare Supplement Plan F. Now, I say for some people, plans F and C are no longer available to people who enrolled in Medicare by January 1, 2020 and beyond. So plan G has become the most uh, popular plan and most comprehensive for most people available for or eligible for Medicare after January 1, 2020. And what this grid is designed to show, and I'm gonna focus on plan G for a moment. You see the green check marks in the boxes in the G column. And what that means to us is for all the things that Medicare does not cover 100%, plan G picks up those, those things. Now you see the red X under the Medicare Part B deductible. And that simply indicates to us that Plan G does not cover the Part B deductible. And as we discussed earlier, the Medicare Part B deductible in 2023 is $226 for the year. So that means enrolling in Medicare Part A and B and enrolling in a Medicare Supplement Plan G uh, means that your only out-of-pocket cost for medical expenses is to satisfy that $226 annual deductible. Now, when I visit with Medicare clients in my office, uh, the first thing I typically do is pull out this page or this document right here. And the reason I do that, let me see if I can get this back to the main part of the screen. What this page is designed to do is simply um, indicate the two basic ways you can get your Medicare benefits delivered to you. And on the left-hand column, what we see is original Medicare parts A and B being delivered to you by the federal government. And then at your option, you can add Medicare part D, a prescription drug plan. And then in addition to that, add a supplement plan. The alternative way to get your Medicare benefits delivered to you is Medicare Advantage, also known as part C. With part C, as we discussed previously, it means you're getting your Medicare part A and B and prescription drug benefits delivered to you all together in one plan. Now, I tell people that are in my office, there are pros and cons to each way of doing this. First of all, let's look at the left-hand column. The benefit to enrolling in original Medicare with a supplement plan is that you have a very defined out-of-pocket maximum for your, your health care. In addition to that, you have no networks to contend with. You can go see any medical provider who takes Medicare. The benefit to Medicare Advantage plans is uh, oftentimes you can get these at much lower premiums and you can get a Medicare supplement plan, especially combined with a Part D plan. The downside is they do have networks for these plans. Oh, one other benefit is most of these plans do offer extra benefits that Medicare doesn't provide. As we discussed earlier, things like vision, dental, over-the-counter benefits, hearing benefits, and a fitness benefit, et cetera. All right, well, that's the down and dirty. That's the very quick version. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna open up to questions and I'll be glad to answer any questions you guys have. So I would suggest anybody that would like to ask a question, uh, please uh, click on your raise hand function. And we have a question from Mark Long. I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, Mark, you're muted. Hello, can you all hear me? 
Yes. 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 Okay. Um, I'm probably about a year and a half away from having to consider Medicare. I retired a about nine months ago and I'm on ACA for now. Um, coming into this, I know nothing about Medicare. And basically the presenter ba um, nearly lost me on like the first few slides. So I have absolutely zero knowledge of this, but within like about the next year, I really need to come up to speed on this. Um, well, the slides you, will be a part of the um, video. We'll have all the slides there and you can take your time later and read them thoroughly. Right, uh, all right, but is, is there any sort of book that, uh, that you might recommend that, you know, when I, that I can, you know, read things over a couple of times, come back later, use as a reference while I try and come up to speed. Well, yeah, the, the, the Bible for Medicare, if you will, is a document called Medicare and you and Medicare publishes a new one every year. Um, if you're not getting one of those mailed to you yet, you can go to medicare.gov and do a search at that website for the book, Medicare and You, and sh you should be able to download one in PDF format. Okay, um, that answers my question for now. I may have questions later and I'll uh, let anybody else uh, take an ask of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I just put a link to that in the chat and the chat will be published with the video too. Lady Geek, did you have your hand up? And Mark, if you could put your hand down. Yeah, uh, what I want, first someone informed me that there's a book called Medicare for Dummies. I haven't read it, but someone is recommending it. Uh, I'd like to uh, first to answer Mark, uh, you are not alone in this question because I'm I'm actually a year out as a co-host. I couldn't fill out your survey, but I'm in with I'm I'm, I'm exactly within the one year range of this of uh, needing all this. Just got my first spam email about Medicare, um, but what I wanted to point out is that you don't need to do this alone. I am using a medical insurance broker. And I mean, I'm very knowledgeable in investing and insurance, but on this, something like this, I think as, as of course you offer your services, Lonnie, uh, there are many, many people across the country who do this. So maybe Mark's first search would be medical insurance broker. This is very different from an insurance agent. They, they You can Google them, they're all over the place. But I hooked up with one who served me for years. And all I did when my parents were ready to go, he just showed up to the house. Here's, here's the plans, here's your choices signed and I just said told my parents to sign it and it's done um the other thing I wanted to what I wanted to know is uh, I'm a widow and my late husband well, well my late husband had was on Medicare and he had private insurance how does the subrogation work when uh if, if I have if I go on some kind of plan like an ACA plan with Medicare uh how, how do I like like, like you, you show your choices in, in the chart but how does that relate in priority like say I'm, I'm worried about subrogation like if i have a better plan do they go to the plan first and then medicare so how do i know what benefit will apply uh are you over the age of 65 no i'm 64 i'll be next week <laughs> okay so uh, when you enroll in medicare uh and you're if you're still employed or you're getting health insurance through years of your spouse's employer uh if you turn when you turn 65 you'll be automatically enrolled in medicare part a uh, so in the background, if you will, um, Medicare Part A and your, your group health insurance plan will coordinate benefits with one another. Uh, when you, once you turn 65 and you're retired and enrolled in Medicare, though, then it's typically a scenario where it's either or. If you have an employer that, that offers retiree health benefits, um, then you choose those health benefits or you choose individual Medicare plans, but you don't do both. Okay, that, that's that's right. Right now, I am retired, and I'm on an ACA plan now. So I said there will be a transition period next yes. year. Yes. Okay, so it's just I just just don't. I'm an engineer, so I'm trying to overanalyze this. So okay, uh, I'll just I'll just chill and uh, and work it out with my broker then. Thank you very much.
Yeah, yeah. Every situation is completely different, so it's hard to make a general statement about uh, uh, retiree health benefit plans uh, versus individual uh, uh, Medicare plans. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Miriam. You have a question for Lonnie. Uh, Miriam's hand is down now. Karen, uh, Karen, you have your hand up. Why don't Hello. you ask Lonnie a question? Yes. Hi, Jim. Jim, I just wanted to show, this is the book that Lonnie mentioned, the Medicare and You book. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this yeah, is the book. It came, it came in the mail. It um, looks pretty comprehensive. I haven't read it. And uh, the links are in the chat notes. Somebody provided the direct PDF link. So, and a couple other suggestions from other books. So I think we have a comprehensive list in the chat now too. Okay, thank you, Miriam. You have a okay. question, Miriam, or would you, uh, is that it? No, I just wanted to mention in the chat, someone posted that you can go to medicare.gov website and enter your current prescriptions and it will show the total cost of different plans including prescriptions for your zip code. Okay, thank you. Does that seem uh, correct, Lonnie? Uh, that's absolutely correct. I'm glad you brought it up, Miriam. Uh, in fact, uh, when we have clients who call or come to us uh, seeking uh, to find what's the best prescription drug coverage for them, uh, and, and best is maybe not the best word to use, but the lowest overall, overall out-of-pocket cost for them, that is the tool we use at medicare.gov because it shows you every prescription drug plan available based on the county you reside in, and it will sort those plans based on total out-of-pocket costs. So it's a very effective tool. And then during open enrollment every year, would you adjust that? Well, yeah, I, I think it's a, a, an excellent idea to review that every year during the enrollment period. And the reason is from one year to the next, uh, these plans can change their formularies, meaning they can move a drug from say tier one to tier two, or they can increase their premiums. And unfortunately, if you're not paying attention, you get into January, for instance, of 2023, and you find, oh, a prescription I paid $5 for last year is now $45, for, for instance. Well, now it's too late to change plans because we're not in the enrollment period any longer. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Karen, you have a question? Yeah. Um I'm wondering if people choose Medicare Advantage because it seems cheaper, the premium is less, and they get more stuff covered. And then later when they need it due to illness or something, are they able to get the supplemental insurance or to go where they want or see who they want? Or do they regret the Medicare Advantage plans? I, I wonder about that. Great question, uh, and, it's, and it's important in consideration. So the way it works is with Medicare supplement plans, uh, we talked about the initial open enrollment period you have when you first enroll in Medicare Part B. After that enrollment, open enrollment period is called for Medicare supplement plans, then you would have to medically qualify. So an answer to your question is, if you've been enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, and let's say you develop some medical condition and I'll just use cancer as an example. Uh, when you get to the enrollment period, the question is, can I go back to a Medicare supplement plan? And in a situation like that, the answer is probably no. At least that's the case here in Texas and in the other three states I'm licensed in, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Now, you might have different laws in your state that would allow you that opportunity, but in those four states, the answer is a resounding no. Now, Let's go to, do people sometimes regret that? Um, po quite possibly, but let me cite an example. Uh, there's a very popular Medicare Advantage plan in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, also out here in the county where I reside. Um, and we have a dear friend who had been enrolled in that plan with no monthly premium for probably 20 years because in her mid 80s, she developed cancer. And I was visiting with her at the hospital and I said, oh, Dottie, I'm so sorry. We didn't know this was going to happen. We could have enrolled you in a Medicare supplement plan. And she just chuckled and said, oh, are you kidding me? For all the premiums I've never paid for a supplement plan for the last 20 years, I'm so far ahead. I'll never spend that much money. So I guess part of it depends on your philosophy. Part of it depends on the math. You know, what, 
how much money did you would you have paid for a supplement plan versus no premium on a Medicare Advantage plan, et cetera? And, and how much risk are you willing to take? Um, the, the very popular Advantage plans in our area have annual out-of-pocket maximums for medical expenses of about $3,900 a year. Um, and that was the kind of plan that she was enrolled in. Um, so, I, I, you know, people ask me on a regular basis, well, what's better, supplement or Medicare Advantage? And my answer is there's no better, there's different. And it depends on what fits your situation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Hey, Charles, you have a question? Charles, you're muted. Okay, how about Wes? Wes, do you have a question? Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, Charles put us in the chat that he sent a question because he has a uh, direct way to Lonnie because he has no microphone. That's not my I'm question. Sure. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll catch that up in the uh, okay. in a minute. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Wes. If you have a question. Sure. Let's see. So, um, I'm a ways from Medicare myself, but I'm trying to help my parents with a decision they have. They are uh, ex IBMers. Um, I don't know if you know anything about the specifics of this situation, right? So, uh, IBM for their retirees helps them out with. Um, their benefits, medical and dental and so on, you know, offer some subsidy. And, um, you know, that's been through me traditional Medicare until this year where they are trying to encourage everyone, well, strongly encourage everyone to go to Medicare Advantage by only offering their subsidies through the Medicare Advantage plan. So I guess my question is maybe two parts. One, if you uh, do happen to know any of the particulars about this situation, if you have any insight onto these into these options. Um, and maybe in general, I'm still wondering about the choice between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. And I'm wondering whether, you know, you say that like, you know, one is not necessarily bet, wor better or worse than the other, but I do wonder about like, you know, once you're under a Medicare Advantage plan, um, you know, like the one that is being pitched sounds great. Like, oh, we cover this and this and this with all these low copays. Um, but I guess I wonder, like, aren't you in the position then of having to fight with this private insurance company that's incentivized to deny your claims and, you know, deny you your coverage, basically? So let me get to the last question first. Um, again, when it comes to choosing between Medicare supplement and Medicare Advantage, uh, I think every person has to decide well, what's the right fit for me. And to your point, if you have concerns that I may end up having to spend some time, energy, and, and frustration fighting an insurance company over the potential of a claim, um, then that's some cause for concern with the Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and I will tell you, we, we probably have 13 to 1400 clients through this office, about 60% are on Medicare Advantage, the other 40% on Medicare Supplement. Um, it, now, the nice thing about Medicare Supplement plans when it comes to claims filing is uh, they, they are secondary to Medicare. Uh, the claim gets filed first with Medicare and Medicare will either approve or deny the claim. And in the vast majority of cases, it's approved. If Medicare approves the claim, the supplement company has no choice or vote in the matter. They must pay, pay the amount of coinsurance they're required to pay based on the plan that you're enrolled in. So that is kind of a nice benefit uh, without question. When you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, then yes, it is up to the plan. I mean, they have to live within the CMS guidelines but there can be some things that original Medicare would have approved that perhaps a Medicare Advantage plan would not approve, or maybe would have to require someone to get prior authorization for. Um, so that's a potential concern or consideration. Now, going back to the IBM scenario, unfortunately, uh, no, I'm not aware of that. Um, in general terms, I can tell you, um, the teacher retirement system here in the state of Texas, 
uh, years ago used to offer Medicare supplement plans for their retirees, and they've gone completely to Medicare Advantage as well. So I see that as a trend that's happening in a lot of places. Did I answer your question? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe as much as you can. I wonder if you could offer some general advice to, you know, how, you know, what should we look for in a Medicare Advantage plan in making a decision about, I mean, effectively, this is go with the Medicare Advantage plan with a subsidy to the monthly premium by IBM, or stick with Medicare Advantage and the current Medigap plan, but lose any subsidy the company was providing to retirees. Yeah, so I think you're just going to have to do some math with that one. Um, so if, and I'm assuming the subsidy, if they enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, would be there to help them pay for any co-pays or co-insurance that they're responsible for. Um, so you, I think you have to sit down and do the math. And, and a couple of big considerations. One is, are the medical providers that they want to see in the network for the Advantage plan that IBM is offering? And two, can they use any kind of a subsidy, as I said, to pay for those co-pays? And there are typically extra benefits on the Advantage plans. Are those the kind of benefits that they would take advantage of, or do they really hold no real value for your parents? Uh, and just weigh the pros and cons of either side. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, Dan, you have a question? Hi. Um, so my, I'm, I'm 49 years old and I got a ways to go until Medicare kicks in, obviously, I hope at least. And uh, uh, you know, between now and then, a lot can change. And I'm looking at this this uh, presentation and it's all applicable now. And I'm wondering how what will be kind of active or what we can expect down the road. So in kind of a, a looking backwards, in the past maybe 10 years or so, in your experience, what have you encountered or seen or observed that has changed significantly about Medicare? And do you have any insight into what you think may happen or change in the next several years as we, as far as the program being program being administered or what it might cover, not cover, and, and changes to costs or whatever? Um, well, good question. And, and Dan, uh, I'm gonna take a little liberty with your question. I'm gonna go back a little more than five years. Um, you know, you may or may not know, but we didn't get prescription drug coverage for Medicare beneficiaries until 2006. Prior to 2006, if you enrolled in Medicare, there was no prescription drug coverage. Um, and, and, and also to, in 2006, Medicare Advantage was really formalized. Prior to those years, going back to the 1990s, um, it was a pilot program. I think it was termed Medicare Plus. And a number of companies that are currently in Medicare Advantage plans uh, helped Medicare with those pilot programs. In regards to Medicare Advantage, over the last five to seven years, at least here in Texas and the other three states that I'm licensed in, we've seen Medicare Advantage plans become more comprehensive and more competitive. We've also seen the population that's enrolled in those plans grow significantly. I couldn't give you percentages. You can probably find that stuff online, but I haven't looked at it in a while. Medicare supplement plans, on the other hand, remain what I would call very stable, meaning uh, there's been a plan or two added over the last several years. There's been a plan or two taken away over the last several years, but, but for the most part, um, the, the very core plans uh, provided the same coverage 5, 10, 15 years ago that they provide today. Premiums are a little bit higher, but, but as compared to the escalation we've seen in prices for commercial health insurance, premiums on Medicare supplement plans have been a lot more moderate or modest. Does that answer the question? That's most of it. I'm, I'm kind of wondering what to expect down the road. And particularly, my retirement plan offers projections of what my cost for health care will be when I retire. And I'm kind of wondering how accurate can that be? Um, if there are significant changes to the program, and I'm wondering if the past informs the future in this case. Oh, thank you for reminding me. So future. Uh, so a couple of important things have been announced recently. We'll see if they come to fruition. But as I understand it, by 2025, um, the, the gov federal government, Medicare, is expecting to cap out-of-pocket expenses for prescription drug costs at $2,500 per beneficiary per year. 
So if that happens, that would be a very welcome change for some of our clients because we've got not, not a high percentage, but we got a few folks spending seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a year in, in uh, co-pays for their prescription drugs because they take very expensive prescriptions. Another thing more specifically to folks with diabetes is there are a number of insulins right now on a list for which you can get them for a $35 copay for a 30-day supply. It's my understanding that discussions are in the works so that within the next couple of years, maybe 2025, 2026, all insulins on Medicare prescription drug plans would be um, uh, a thirty-five dollar copay for a thirty thirty-day supply. That too would be a very welcome relief. Other than that, I, I would expect to we would continue to see um, more more competition in the Medicare Advantage world uh, because uh, those plans, at least in areas of, of a high population, are getting more competitive all the time. And I, I think that's a trend that will continue for a while. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, you have a question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, could you go over the registration sequence again that you did in the very initial, um, I guess, uh, paragraphs that you did? Sure. Yeah, so, and, and I'm assuming you're talking for when you turn 65, is that correct? That's right. I'm, I'm 63 now, turning 64 in a few months. And uh, I, I just like, I, I was surprised to hear there was a countdown coming up so soon that I had to do something. So I guess I was a bit struck by that, but uh, I, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so as you're approaching your 65th birthday, uh, you can expect that your Medicare eligibility will begin the first day of the month that you turn 65 unless your birthday actually falls on the first of the month, then your first day, uh, your Medicare eligibility will be the, the month prior to your birthday. Um, assuming you're not getting, med uh, excuse me, social security retirement benefits, then Medicare is going to default to enrolling you in Medicare Part A only. And for the vast majority of people, there's no premium, so that's okay. Um, if you're retired, um, then you will want to also enroll in Medicare Part B. So you'll either need to go to the Social Security Administration website and enroll online or give them a call at the toll-free number 800-772-1213. And you can begin that process up to 90 days in advance of your Medicare eligibility date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Carol has a number of questions that were submitted with the RSVP. So I'll turn it over to Carol. Great. Okay, so, okay, this question says, if I have a Medigap policy in the state where I live, but I periodically travel to receive services in a different state like Massachusetts, which does not offer that Medigap plan, would my Medigap coverage still work for those services? I, I'm going to say yes. Uh, I I'm not familiar with laws in Massachusetts, but I don't know of any reason they would not accept your Medigap plan. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I guess I'll keep asking as long as nobody else has a, their hand raised. Um, how does a retiree Blue Cross supplemental health insurance coordinate with Medicare? Uh, good question. And I'm gonna tell you that here in Texas, uh, You either get retiree coverage uh, that, that behaves either like a Medicare Advantage plan or acts much like a Medicare supplement plan uh, so that, uh, and if it's not a standardized supplement plan that you can buy in an individual marketplace, most of them are designed to cover most or all of the things that Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B don't cover. Um, because for retiree plans, companies know, have known for decades now that uh, Medicare Part A and Part B are, are uh, serving as the foundation of your health insurance from that point to the time you, you pass away. Okay. Can you comment on how TRICARE for Life works with Medicare? Oh, I, I, I'm not an expert in TRICARE for Life. Um, and let me just make this very general comment. We have um, clients or spouses of clients who have TRICARE for Life and I would just say as a very general statement, 
if you have TRICARE for life, you probably don't need any other coverage. Uh, it, again, kind of like a corporate retiree plan, it dovetails nicely with Medicare and leaves the beneficiary of TRICARE for life with very little to no out-of-pocket cost for medical care. So for those who have served and, and are qualified for TRICARE for life, thanks for your service and, and good for you that you have this awesome benefit available to you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, the next question is, are all Medicare Advantage plans high deductible and in-network plans? Uh, all Medicare Advantage, well, the vast majority of Medicare Advantage plans have a network. Uh, as I said in the presentation, if you're in an HMO plan, then you must remain in the network unless it's a medical emergency. If you have a PPO plan, you can go outside the network, typically at a higher out-of-pocket cost than using an in-network provider. And what was the other part of the question, Carol? Uh, okay, so are they high deductible and are they, do they all have networks? Uh, most Medicare Advantage plans have no deductible for um, um, medical cost. Some have a deductible for your prescription drug coverage, but typically tier one and tier two drugs are not subject to that deductible. Uh, now, all these plans have an annual out-of-pocket maximum, uh, but, but most no deductible. Okay, thank you. I do thank have you. more um, RSVB questions, but we do have a, an audience member that has a live question, so we'll do that. Okay. Okay, Big H Ben Camp, Lawrence, Texas. Lawrence Kansas, I'd like to ask you a question. Yeah. Lonnie, what is the reason that uh, Medicare Advantage plans have acquired such a bad rap? Um, the consumer groups, the AARP, Ralph Nader, have criticized celebrities like Joe Namath and other folks who are promoting these plans, and they've almost acquired the reputation of annuities, that is, buyer be very wary. Um, one specific thing that I, I have read, I don't know this, but, I, but about which I've read, is that Medicare Advantage plans, if you are not careful, um, are a good deal um, coverage wise. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Hey, Big H, uh, could you repeat your question? You have a huge okay. amount of background music going on. Yeah, sorry, I muted you because I heard, yeah, the, the background noise. Uh, go ahead just again. Re, sorry yeah, about just that. Your question. Uh, is, it, is that better? Yeah. Much better, yes. much better. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Lonnie, what, what is the reason that Medicare Advantage plans have acquired such a bad rap? Um, celebrities like Joe Namath and others are being criticized for promoting these plans. Uh, AARP Magazine consumer groups, Ralph Nader, have criticized um, Medicare Advantage plans. They've almost acquired um, the same kind of reputation as annuities, that is buyer beware, uh, read the fine print. And one specific criticism that I have read about Medicare Advantage plans is that they are, they are a good deal for the uh, enrollee during the early years of their retirement when they don't have um, as many healthcare needs, but that during the later years of their retirement, um, there's often denial of benefits, denial of coverage. So my question is general to you, Lonnie, and, and my question is, um, can you address some of the, the, the more common bad raps against Medicare Advantage plans? And can you also um, maybe address some of the counter narratives to uh, the bad raps on, on Medicare Advantage plans? Because uh, it, it just seems in popular media, ARP magazines, uh, these things are, seem to be quite controversial. There are a lot of warnings and, you know, a lot of cautions to readers. And, and so that's my question. Okay. I'll do my best to answer that. So first of all, um, Medicare Advantage plans, I, I think have gotten a bad rap because when you compare them to original Medicare, one of the things is, is that they have a network. And a lot of people that are on Medicare have, have or prefer not to have the network. So that's one. 
Secondly, even some medical providers who have signed the network agreements and accept these Medicare Advantage plans are not crazy about them. And I suspect that's because the claims filing process is more cumbersome and more complex than the claims filing process for original Medicare. Let me give you an example. Three or four years ago, my mom, who since passed away, was in the hospital with cancer. I was visiting, the doctor walks in the room, and he's discussing her potential treatment, and he makes the comment that, hey, I think you should be on original Medicare instead of this Medicare Advantage plan that you're enrolled in. And my question was, well, if you don't like it, why'd you sign the contract? Um, that kind of a deal. Now, it, it is true. There have been some Advantage plans. There are some Advantage plans who make it difficult for folks to get treatment, um, specifically for very expensive things that, that might be going on in their lives. Now, the other side of that is every Advantage plan has an appeals process. And the initial appeal in that process, of course, you're talking to the, the insurance company. So maybe there's not too much incentive uh, for them to overturn their original decision to deny coverage. However, there are several levels of this appeal. And by the time you get to the third level, you're talking to a third party that's not associated with the, the health plan at all. Um, and look, I've had, out of all the clients we have here, I've had maybe five that have gone through an appeal of any sort. And I can think of one who's gone to the third level of appeal. And once they got to the third level of appeal, the, the original decision to decline coverage was overturned and, and they were able to get the, the treatment that they'd asked for and that they needed. Um, now, I can't tell you that's gonna happen every time. And, and I, I mean, I, I can tell you that I like you, when I look at TV commercials and J.J. Walker and Joe Namath and you know, other celebrities of years past are, are touting these plans. It, it gives me kind of a cheesy feeling about them, to be quite frank with you. Um, it, but, but I guess I'm going to go back to something I said earlier, and that simply is this. Everybody's needs to make the decision that's best for them. Um, and, and, and when I have clients that I talk with over the phone and are in my office and will ask me point blank, which should I do? And my answer is consistently, I'm not here to tell you which one you should do. I'm here to inform you about how this one works and about how this one works. And I want you to pick the one that works best for your particular situation. Now, let me go back to one thing that you said. And, and after I say that, please remind me of other things I haven't addressed. Um, and that is in later years, when people maybe are inclined to need more medical services, Medicare supplement plans might work better. Um, what we've actually seen here in our office is we've had clients in their mid to late 80s with Medicare supplement plan premiums getting to be, oh, let's say 350 or so dollars per month for each uh, spouse. So they're spending five, six, seven thousand dollars a year in premium for each of them. When you when you calculate the bench sub premium plus a prescription drug plan premium, et cetera. And what we found is if we can find them in a Medicare Advantage plan with an annual out-of-pocket cost lower uh, than the premiums are paying on the Medicare supplement plan, that seems to serve them well. And at least here in Texas, we haven't had what I would call a significant number of problems with uh, treatments being denied or claims being denied for things that, that people really need. I'm not telling you it hasn't happened. I'm just saying I, I haven't seen a, a, a lot of it here in our area. Um, have I missed anything? Well, just as a quick corollary question to that, um, are there vetted lists out there um, from, say, reliable source? I, 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 I'm sure I can do the Google search on this, but just wondering if, if you know offhand, are there... Um, lists by reputable sources of, 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 of plans that are vetted and um, I, I'm not sure how to phrase my question, but you, you know, like the ones you should avoid, the ones that uh, deny coverage and are really hard to deal with versus the ones that are on the up and up. 
The only resource that I'm familiar with is CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, gives every Medicare prescription drug plan and every Medicare Advantage plan a star rating. And for instance, one of the more popular plans in our area enjoys a five star, which is the highest rating uh, that one of those plans can get. Um, and and I, would all, I would look at that and you can find that information either in the documentation from the plan itself because they all have to provide that document to you. Uh, or if you go to cms.gov, input your zip code county and look for Medicare Advantage plans, uh, that star rating information is on that website. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Carol, do you have some questions from the chat? Or from the RSVP, sorry. Yes, okay, now this is a few sentences, so let me read the whole thing. Okay. okay, question on Medicare Advantage trial right. The situation is I enrolled in a Medicare A and B at 65 with a G supplement and Part D plan. This was more than 12 months ago. Question, does the Medicare Advantage trial right allow me to return to original Medicare within 12 months with a guaranteed issue right of the G supplement from either A, any insurer in my state, or B, only the plan of my current insurer? I hope you understand that question. I, I do understand the question. Great, great. Yes, and it's a very good question. So yes, um, at any time you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan and it's your first time to be in a plan and it's within the first 12 months, you have what's called a 12 month trial period. And anytime during that trial period, if you choose to go back to original Medicare, then you have a couple of options on supplement plans. If you can medically qualify, then you can apply for any Medicare supplement plan available in your area and enroll in that Medicare supplement plan and also enroll in a Medicare prescription drug plan of your choosing. If on the other hand, you've developed a medical condition and you can no, no longer medically qualify to enroll in a Medicare supplement plan, then you, you have a guaranteed issue right to go back to the Medicare supplement plan that you were enrolled in prior to enrolling in the Medicare Advantage plan. Now, the exception to that is, is if uh, you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan when you first become a Medicare Advantage plan,
drug plan without any underwriting. However, in order to enroll in a Medicare supplement plan, you must be able to medically qualify to get into that plan. Okay, thank you. Robert, why don't you go ahead and I'll get some more from my list if you want to. Okay, uh, this question, Lonnie, is, is uh, not specific to Medicare, but it's dealing with Medicare and Social Security. Currently, I'm on Medicare, and uh, but I'm not on Social Security yet. But next year, I'll be going on Social Security. I'm assuming at that time that, uh, and right now I'm paying for my Medicare, just you know, withdrawal out of my checking account. When I go on Social Security, they will automatically begin uh, taking my premiums out of my Social Security at that time, I assume. And, that is cool. and I'll have to stop my, my checking uh, payment. Hopefully there won't be an overlap there. <laughs> right, where I overpay on them. And then my second part of that is my wife, who's on Social Security right now, but not Medicare, will be going on spousal Medicare next year when I go on Social Security. And I'm assuming at that time also, uh, her Medicare will be changed also. So does, I guess my question is, does Medicare and Social Security handle this pretty transparently or, or can I expect some problems? Uh, no, I've never heard of anybody having major problems with the premiums for Medicare Part B. And to your point, when you start getting a Social Security retirement check, they will automatically begin deducting that check from, from your Social Security before you see it. And the same will happen for your wife as well. Um, and, and they should automatically stop drafting out of your account if that's how it's currently set up. So I, I don't expect you'll have any problems at all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Miriam, you want to go ahead? Yes, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I would just like to ask uh, Lonnie, what you just mentioned about if one is on an advantage plan that you can switch to traditional Medicare during open enrollment, including the drug plan without a physical, without being medically qualified for it. I, I assume that's a physical. However, for your 20% the Medicare does not cover, I, you would need to medically qualify for that plan. Is that correct? Was that my correct understanding? That is a correct understanding. Let me, let me just note one thing. When I say medically qualify, I'm not talking about a physical, I'm talking about do they ask medical questions on an en enrollment form? And so for uh, prescription drug plans, there, there are no medical questions. It's a matter of are you eligible to enroll based on the fact that you're just getting on Medicare or because we're in the enrollment period? Uh, so there's never any medical questions asked on those, uh, unlike the Medicare supplement plans where uh, there are medical questions asked and underwriting, uh, meaning they can de determine whether they want to accept your application or decline it. And this would be, for example, do you have diabetes? Do you, have you ever been treated for cancer? Those types of questions? Uh, yeah, and, and so good question. Um, let me talk a little bit about that. And of course, what I'm about to tell you probably will vary from state to state. But here in Texas, uh, for most Medicare supplement companies, it's okay if you've had cancer, as long as you haven't been treated for cancer, let's say in the previous two years, or in some cases, three years. Uh, for people who have diabetes, um, if you're not taking insulin, that's typically not a problem at all. And there are some companies, even for people who are on insulin, but are taking, let's say, 50 units or less per day, uh, oftentimes they can qualify. Um, another area that can sometimes cause people to, to be declined is uh, heart situations. So have you had a pacemaker installed, uh, implanted, and, and, uh, and those kinds of things? Are people with blood pressure, for instance, we have a couple of companies that will ask the medical question, do you have high blood pressure and do you take three or more medications to control that blood pressure? Um, that seems to be a concern for underwriting in some companies. Uh, so, so cancer, oh, uh, any kind of debilitating disease like Lou Gehrig's or Parkinson's, uh, if you've developed those kinds of diseases, then typically for most companies in Texas, you're not gonna qualify for a medically underwritten Medicare supplement plan. In other words, you really can't plan for the future. Uh, on something like this, that 
when you, it seems that when you come close to the Medicare decision, you should really look very carefully at down the road, what you can get out of in case it's not working out. And perhaps when you approach the Medicare decision, you just go for, you might want to just go for a safer route because you don't know what your medical history will be. Well, that's a good point. Um, but, but sort of like investing, some people are willing to take more risk than others uh, with their investment styles. So, you know, de de depends on what you want to do. Uh, and, and let me give you an example. Um, here in Texas, we have some Medicare Advantage plans. Now, in most cases, well, the one I'm thinking of in particular offers no prescription drug coverage. So it's not designed for everybody for sure. Uh, but we have some people who are eligible for VA benefits and get their prescriptions filled through the VA system. Uh, but this Advantage plan, in addition to having no monthly premium, will will reduce your Medicare Part B premium by as much as $125 a month. Well, for some people, that's kind of an important situation, um, living on a fixed income that maybe hasn't kept pace with inflation over the last 10 years or so. Um, so again, I, I'm going to go back to the statement. You need to do what fits your situation when it comes to choosing your Medicare coverage. Right, it's very personal. It, it really depends on your overall financial situation, your personal situation, your health situation, your family situation, uh, the whole big, the whole big uh, picture. Uh, without question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to jump in with. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that Jim? Yeah, go ahead, Carol. I'm going to jump in with two more, and then we'll let Wes go. Okay. Um, this should be fairly simple. I'm a retired federal employee collecting an annuity and I'm covered by the federal employee health benefits, FEHB, that, and I do not receive social security. How will I pay Medicare Part B premiums? I don't have any idea. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, probably would have to, um, hmm. Now, I, I'm Call in, the federal I'll, government, right? Try to get an answer right. I'll take a stab. Uh, for instance, people that have re railroad retirement benefits versus um, Social Security benefits, that system will automatically deduct your Part B premiums. I would guess that a federal retiree would have the same situation happen, that they would have it deducted from their pension, if you will. Uh, but again, that's a guess. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, I'll do one more. Um, do any special enrollment periods apply for Medigap? if enrolling several years after enrolling in part B. So at age 65, I will have part B plus supplement coverage through my former employer and continue until I'm age 69 when I would like to purchase Medigap coverage. So the question is about the enrollment period for Medigap coverage like at 69. Okay, so as I understand it, you're, you're gonna work to age 69 and I'm assuming you're gonna have group health coverage through your employer up until the point that you retire. That's what the question says, yeah. Okay, so in that scenario, you will still have uh, your, your Medicare supplement or Medigap open enrollment period uh, at the point you retire. Um, and, and technically it might not be open enrollment period, but it be, might be guaranteed issue period. But in either event, you will be eligible to get on a Medicare supplement plan without having to go through the underwriting process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wes, you can go ahead with- Yeah, um, so I wanna follow up on the uh, last question about uh, medical um, qualification for Medigap plans. Um, and I guess my question is, you know, based on medical uh, questions on the application, they can decide whether or not to accept you. But is the premium also dependent on your answers to those medical questions? Uh, for the vast majority of companies that I represent, um, it, you either get accepted or declined. Uh, and the only thing that will change your premium is whether you use or don't use tobacco products. Now, there is one company that I represent that, that uh, there are a set of questions that if you answer yes to any of those questions, you're going to be declined. But then there's a second set of questions 
you can answer yes to, and it's not be, it's not so that you would be accepted or declined, but to determine whether you qualify for the very lowest premium. And there's about a uh, 5%, 6% difference between the very lowest premium and the next premium tier up. So that happens with some companies. Um, in fact, United Healthcare, if I remember correctly, at least in the state of Texas, uh, does that as well. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Donna, you can go ahead with your question. Hi, thanks, Carol. My question was about um, getting advice that is uh, um, th that's really objective and not not tied to the person I'm talking to making a profit. And I don't want to offend you, Lonnie. I don't, I'm not clear about the whole idea of um, Medicare brokers. I feel like my husband will be eligible for Medicare early next year. And we've just gotten a ton of uh, stuff in the mail, right? Everyone wanting to quote, help us. And there are, I know also there are uh, like a nonprofit in my area, MMAP, which someone on the chat was mentioning that they thought the volunteers at nonprofits frequently didn't know very much. So. Can you help us understand when you talk about the companies you represent, like what do, what do I look for when finding someone uh, to work with on this, if I wanted to work with someone? Sure. So I, I would suggest you probably have friends or family members that are in Medicare, and I would hope there's at least one or two of those that are working with an agent or broker with whom they're very satisfied. Um, if that's not the case, then maybe do a search online and make a couple of phone calls. And I think one of the uh, one of the fast ways to determine if an agent or broker is working in your best interest instead of his or her best interest is that they ask more questions than they they make statements. Um, if you call my office, you know what you'll find is we want to learn about you because we want to learn one. What drugs do you take that we need to be aware of uh, that we can price appropriately or, or find out how to get covered? Two, if you're looking at Medicare Advantage, who, who are your doctors? Because the last thing we want to do is enroll you in a plan uh, that would cause you to have to change your doctors if that's not what you want. And three, I, I think we're all experienced enough in life at this point that you can tell when somebody's trying to sell you something rather than someone's trying to help you find the best fit for your situation. Um, and, and, and what state are you in, Don? Uh, Michigan. I'm sorry? The state of Michigan. Okay, well, you need to move further south. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm chance. Glad you the, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you caught the humor in that. Um, but yeah, I would think, you know, look around. You can find somebody reputable that'll help you find the right plan um, and, and, and find something that fits for you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, I'll take a couple more from the RSVP list. Um, okay. What evidence of creditable coverage will I need to have if I'm continuing to be covered under an employer plan after age 65? How do I get that evidence and to whom do I need to submit it and when? Good question. So if, if it's an employer-based plan, your employer should be sending you a letter every year from the time you turn 65, and that letter will confirm that your plan offers creditable coverage, and this is specific to prescription drug coverage that is at least as good as Medicare's prescription drug coverage. And you may need to submit that once you enroll in a prescription drug plan, and the reason you'll, you may need that is because if you cannot uh, provide evidence that you've had creditable coverage from the time you've turned 65, you may be subject to a late enrollment penalty for prescription drug coverage. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, here's another one from the RSVP list. I would like to know the impact on pricing of Medigap plans as one moves from one state to another. Is it different if you wait till open enrollment as opposed to doing a special enrollment? In other words, should I time my move with open enrollment because I will get a better price during that period? I would not be surprised if that makes a difference. Uh, in my opinion, no, you shouldn't time your move based on an enrollment period. And if, if you're in a Medicare supplement plan by a major company, I'm, I'm talking a Humana, Aetna, United Healthcare, any, any national company, 
in all likelihood, they will offer Medicare supplements uh, to, the, to the place you're moving to as well. And if that's the case, there may be an adjustment in the premium you pay based on the zip code you're moving from versus the zip code you're moving to. Now, I, I can't tell you whether it's up or down, but it shouldn't be a 50% change. We're probably talking a five to 10% change at the very most in my estimation. Now, if you were to happen to move from one area to another area and you're in, enrolled in, let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield of your state, and the parent of Blue Cross Blue Shield of your state is, is not the parent of Blue Cross Blue Shield of the state you're moving to, then you will get a guaranteed issue period for a Medicare supplement plan when you move to your new location. Thank you. Mark, why don't you go ahead with your question? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, one, you know, I'm, I'm demonstrating my uh, noob status with Medicare, but could you go over the evil 10% Irma penalty again. Uh, I was kind of struck by that, that, you know, a 10% for life, uh, that was kind of difficult to swallow. I'd like to hear a little bit more of that. Thank you. Okay. So the Irma uh, income related monthly adjustment amount is not a straight across the board 10%. And it's not for life, um, unless you enjoy a very high income, uh, well into retirement. The way it works is, for instance, in 2023, they're going to base any earner you might be subject to on your 2021 income, and they're always two years behind. Um, so, for instance, if you let's say let's say you uh, sold some property in 2021 that brought your income up by two, three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, whatever, that will increase your Medicare Part B premium in 2023. But as you move to 2024 and you don't have that property sell in 2022, then um, your, your Medicare Part B IRMA adjustment will go back down. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yeah, sort of, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it's good enough for now. Thank you. Well, please get more, I mean, I don't know enough about it to ask an educated question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, like I say, I came into this cold and I'm kind of struck by it. So yeah, I understand. I, I got to come up to speed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and look, um, you guys have access to my phone number. If, if you have something specific or you want to get into more detail, just call me. Even if you don't live in a state I serve, I'm happy to answer your question now. The caveat is this, uh, busy time of year. It may take me a while to get back to you. Thank you. Don, why don't you go ahead? Don, are you there? You have your hand raised? Okay, in the meantime, I'm gonna ask another one from the RSVP. This one's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. Are there any insurance companies that are considered the best for us to use to purchase Medicare supplement plans? Any guidance on how to pick an insurance company for the supplement? What happens if the insurance company we pick goes out of business or stops offering supplement plans? I've heard that AARP allows users, users of the United Healthcare Medicare, Medicare supplement plans to change between their plans without having to get a medical review. Is this true? I'm interested in starting on a plan G high deductible, but would like the option to move to standard plan G down the road. What are your thoughts on the high deductible supplement plans? Was that too many questions in a row? <laughs> well, I'll answer what I can remember and what okay. I missed if you, if you would okay. remind me, Carol. Um, okay, so as far as picking a company, um, uh, one, I, I'm always looking for a competitive premium with the caveat being, I want it to be with a company that, that is on solid financial footing. So I look at A and best ratings for a company, and I want them to be at least an A minus rating. That's just my personal opinion. And there are a lot of companies in our area that are rated A and best, A minus, or higher that offer very competitive premiums. Now, when it comes to selecting a particular Medicare supplement plan, in your example, high deductible plan G, um, yeah, that fits your situation. That's fantastic. Uh, when you select a high deductible plan versus a standard plan G, obviously the premium is going to be significantly less uh, here in Texas, probably 
55% lower premium for a high deductible G versus a, a standard plan G. Just understand you've got the deductible. And if that fits your situation, that's fine. Now, uh, in, in regards to having the idea that I'm going to start off with a high deductible plan G and then later move to the standard plan G, remember, moving from one's Medicare supplement plan to another supplement plan, even if it's with the same company, is going to require medical underwriting. So just keep in mind that your plan to move will work as long as you don't have a, a medical condition that will prevent you from qualifying for underwriting. And Carol, what did I miss in that question? The only thing I think uh, there was a question about whether United Healthcare allows a change between supplement plans without having to get a medical review. And this, uh, specifically, if the state matters, this is Florida. Yeah, well, uh, it, it laws may be different in Florida and Texas. Uh, moving from any plan to another plan, United Healthcare or otherwise, requires underwriting. Thank you. This is a quick question. Um, is there a premium for Part D if you sign up after age 65 because you still work and have employee medical benefits? Do you, does that question make sense? I think so. So all Medicare Part D or prescription drug plans have a premium. I, I think what you're probably asking is, is there a late enrollment penalty? And that goes back to a previous question. Uh, if you're working, getting, getting uh, health insurance through your employer or spouse's employer, um, you're okay delaying enrollment in Medicare Part B and, and in a Medicare plan without penalty. But your employer should be providing a letter every year letting you know that uh, your prescription drug coverage is creditable uh, drug coverage based on Medicare guidelines. And as long as that's the case, then you shouldn't face or won't face a late enrollment penalty um, when you when you decide to retire and enroll in Medicare. Thank you. Here's a question. I think most of this has been covered, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyway. Um, it's about how do you how to choose supplement insurance is or is it better to take Medicare Advantage, which includes a drug prescription plan? This is kind of multi part question. Can you get Part D laid with no penalties? I think you just talked about that. Um, can you switch from a Medicare supplement plan to an Advantage plan for the first time and then switch back to a supplement plan within the first 12 months without doing medical underwriting? This is the state of Michigan. Okay. So we've talked about the Medicare Advantage trial right period that you right. get the first time you enroll in an Advantage plan for, for, for 12 months. Now, if you're moving from a Medicare supplement plan to an Advantage plan, uh, you can do that any year during the annual enrollment period, October 15 through December 7. There's no medical underwriting for that. Um, other part of that question, Carol? Um, I think you covered it, or because you did talk about Part D later. Can you get Part D later with no penalties? Is it better to take Medicare Advantage with a drug prescription plan? And you, in detail, you kind of said, one is not necessarily better. They're just different. And it kind of depends on your, right. how much risk you want to take your situation. So I think you, I think we covered most okay. of that. Uh, since he mentioned prescription drug uh, plan, late enrollment penalty, let me just talk for a second about how that works. Great. Uh, so if you don't enroll in a prescription drug plan when you first become eligible and you never enroll in a drug plan, then there's no late enrollment penalty. But if you fail to enroll when you're first eligible and then enroll at some subsequent date, what Medicare does is they take the average price of drug plans across the country, that's about $33 a month, uh, and they multiply that times 1%, so 33 cents, and they multiply that times the number of months that you were eligible but didn't have a plan. So if it's five years that you were without a drug plan and then subsequently enroll, those numbers multiply times 60. Um, I did the math for somebody just the other day so that equated to about a $19 monthly late enrollment penalty that you're subject to paying every month for as long as you have a prescription drug plan in force. Great, thank you. Um, here's yeah. a general question. Um, what does Medicare cover? Uh, maybe you could talk about what it doesn't cover, some of the things that it doesn't cover that Medicare Advantage does cover. Maybe that would be a good thing. Yeah. To 
Good question. So Medicare is part A and B, obviously hospital coverage, uh, medical coverage, and, and this is, well, in a word, medical. Um, so no long-term care. Uh, and of course, long, Medicare Advantage plans don't cover long-term care anyway, uh, or either. Um, Medicare is designed to help with medical expenses, not custodial expenses for our long-term care. Now, as far as the things that Medicare, original Medicare does not cover, that Advantage plans do cover, or in many cases cover, oftentimes they offer a fitness benefit. A very popular program offered by some Medicare Advantage plans is called Silver Sneakers. And what Silver Sneakers does is allows the beneficiary to enroll in a local fitness club. Often YMCAs are very popular within that program for which you don't pay any premium uh, to be enrolled or any monthly fee to be enrolled. Many plans also offer dental coverage. Now that dental coverage can vary dramatically from one plan to the other. And I, let, let me just say a word about dental coverage as well. Oftentimes the dental coverage is offered by any individual plan or any Medicare Advantage plan uh, does not have a broad network of dentists to accept the plan. So that's, that's an important consideration. A lot of these plans offer some type of vision coverage, um, not amazingly comprehensive, but for instance, a typical scenario might be that you get um, uh, your prescription uh, at no copay at an optometrist, and then a plan will pay somewhere between $100 and $300 toward your glasses or contacts each year might be a, a typical scenario. A lot of plans also offer some uh, uh, significant help with hearing aids. Um, so co-pays might range anywhere from $150 on the low end to $1,200 on the high end. And it all depends on what level of sophistication or technology you need in the hearing aid. And then finally, a lot of these plans offer an over-the-counter benefit where you get either a paper or online catalog where once every calendar quarter, you can order things out of this catalog. Typical scenario might be that you would order $50 worth of things from a catalog that provides items that you would find, normally find over the counter in a pharmacy. Things like over the counter medications, vitamins, supplements, bandages, et cetera. Supplemental plans, I can get close, but 
I never get the right number unless I'm willing to put up with a lot of sales calls. Um, and then the last thing is, one of the people asked the question about trying to pick out Advantage versus original Medicare. Uh, the future is uncertain. We all know that. Uh, the only thing I can tell you to sort of alleviate some of the uncertainty is look at your own health. Figure out whether you're a healthy person, not so healthy. Look at your family history. Determine whether you're healthy or not. None of that really is going to necessarily predict whether you're going to need a lot of medical services or not. But that might take away some of the uncertainty because if you know if you exercise regularly, you're, you know you're a marathon runner or something like that. That doesn't mean you're not going to die tomorrow, but it does mean that you're in fairly good health. If on the other hand, both your mom and dad died of heart disease at the age of 62, you know you probably got a heart disease problem somewhere along the line. That might help you pick a better thing. And as Lonnie says, it determines you have to figure out what what risk you have, but only you know what your own personal risk is by looking at your family history if you have it. And that's it. Well, Don, thank you for that plug. $100 will be in the mail to you tomorrow, okay? <laughs> we, we have no business relationship. <laughs> is anybody, Jim, are you, are you around? Uh, does anybody else have any um, more questions? Now's your chance. I think I got all of them from the RCP, or at least the ones. There's one about Social Security that didn't involve Medicare, so I'm, I'm you know, that doesn't really apply in this meeting. So I'm not going to ask that one. I think. Well, we've awesome. we've uh, had Lonnie on the line here now for 90 minutes, and he's done a great job explaining all this. Plus, we'll put all the slides and the video online in the next week or so. So uh, maybe we should call it quits here. Jim, I did have a slide with uh, Lonnie's contact information. Is it okay if I share that screen? Or do you have? Yes, one? go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, let me try to do that. Let's see. It's up here. Share screen. There we go. And this will also be in the slide packet. So you can contact Alani later if you would like to. Um, yeah, we put so, that in the chat also. You want me to talk about the upcoming meetings, Jim? Anything yes, else? please. Okay. So uh, there's three upcoming meetings that I want to mention. Wednesday, November 2nd at 7 p.m. Central. The New York City and uh, South Florida Boco Heads will have, I am hoping I'm pronouncing this correctly, Eric Balshunis, who is the author of The Bogo e Effect. And then on Saturday, November 5th at 1230 Central, the Sacramento California um, area chapter will do a, a healthcare coverage. It will include a small segment on Medicare, but, and then um, what are the other things Jim is gonna cover? Um, just general ACA questions, um, COBRA, and there was one other item. Um, to uh, sign up for this uh, meeting, it's not on the regular Boglehead calendar. You have to go to a Boglehead thread called Sacramento, California area chapter master thread. I'm sorry, it's a little more difficult to sign up for this one. And then the third one is Wednesday, December 7th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to do a meeting, uh, just an open discussion on the one more year syndrome where people, you know, they want to retire and like, oh, I'm just going to do one more year, especially in this kind of bear market. Oh, maybe I should just do one more year. And then they just can't decide. Then the next year they say, I want to do one more year. So I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like to discuss, especially in this, you know, this late time in the year where you're kind of just, you know, wondering, oh, should I quit at the end of the year? Should I do a whole nother year? That kind of thing. So we think people might enjoy that kind of an open discussion. That it, Jim. We definitely want to thank Lonnie very much for his time. We're very lucky that we got him to agree to do this presentation, especially during his, his busy period when everybody's trying to do the open enrollment. And, and uh, of course, there's another period. You know, people have periods based on their birthday. So basically, it's year round, but I know there's a special enrollment period right now. So we're lucky to have him. But thank you so much, Lonnie. We appreciated your presentation and all your patience with the hour of QA, <laughs> more than an hour of QA. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me.
You're welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. And you were very capable at answering questions. You really picked up on the questions very quickly. And some of them were quite complicated. So well, thank, thank you. you so much. Did my contact info, did that contact screen share the, with Lonnie's information on it? Yes, it did. Okay, yes, it did. Great. Um, All right, so if we're ever in Louisiana, we have to stop at Rain, right? Is that the name of it, Rain? <laughs> the That's frog right. capital some, of the world. Get some fried frog legs. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks again, Lonnie, the excellent job. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, really have a great weekend. All right, bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks for Thank joining so us, much. everybody. Thank you. Stop the recording.